Good afternoon. Welcome to Child Sexual Abuse and Child Advocacy uh, for Beginners. My name is Michelle Dixon-Wall. I'm the Advocacy Services Manager here at the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Program. And here's my colleague. Hi, everybody. My name is Soleil Muniz, and I am the Child Advocacy Coordinator. Okay. I'll let you, Soleil, um, get us started. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, to begin with, we are going to start with the prevalence of child sexual abuse. Um, it is estimated that 20 to 30% of girls and about 15% of boys will have some kind of sexual abuse experience. Um, and the study of women in Washington state found that 38% of women reported some type of sex sexual assault experience during their lifetime, with 80% of these incidences taking place before they even turned 18. Um, child sexual abuse occurs along a continuum that can include fondling a child's genitals, masturbation, oral genital contact, digital penetration, and vaginal and or anal penetration. And child sexual abuse could also include non-contact abuse, such as exposure, voyeurism, child pornography, anything like that. Um, while some cases involve the use of force or threats of violence, most do not. And you should also bear in mind that some of the material in this lesson may be difficult. This is a very, not exactly a cheerful subject, one would say. Um, and particularly because this is an online training format, please remember to do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Then this might include talking with a supervisor or an advocate at your program about questions or challenges that come up. Thank you. Great reminder, Sol. Thank you so much. Um, the offenders, most offenders are someone the child already knows and trusts. There's been a lot of myth around sexual assault and sexual abuse around, um, you know, that it's often strangers, but that um, is a myth that's been uh, disproven. So most offenders are someone that the child already knows, that they trust, like a relative, a coach, a child care worker, or a neighbor. About a third of cases involve a family member from either the immediate or extended family. And only about 10% of those cases do involve strangers. Offenders take advantage of the child's um, inexperience and innocence and trusting nature. Sometimes the abuse is misrepresented as normal behavior or as a game. Offenders may manipulate children by offering rewards um, gifts, a special relationship, a special secret to get them to go along with abusive behavior. Children are usually taught that older people have power and authority over them uh, based on our cultural context of, text and how, what we learn within our families. Um, so they don't feel that they have a choice in these situations. And so then we come to uh, child sexual abuse laws. Uh, Washington state laws make all forms of sexual contact by an adult with a child illegal based on the age of the victim and regardless of any other circumstances, including the use of force or threats or the child's behavior. So even if there was no threats or violence or force, it is still child abuse. Um, and, it's, and it is, can still count um, I mean, it is still illegal. Right. Uh, and so how do you get, how do these people get to the point where they are abusing a child? And most of the time it starts with grooming. And, you know, child sexual abuse, it does not just happen. Perpetrators specifically target their victims. Um, they tend to choose those who are lonely, isolated, uh, without power. Uh, children who may be from traditionally marginalized groups, uh, and they go through a very intentional process of getting close to the child, and that is known as the grooming process. Offenders typically groom not just the child, but the family and the community as well. 
So grooming is a deliberate action taken by an offender to form a trusting relationship with the intent of having sexual contact with a child in the future. So they make, they not only convince the child that they are a safe person, but they also convince the family and the community that they're a safe person. And that way, there aren't as many eyes on them. There's, no, there's not as many, like there's nobody keeping watch over them because they are safe and trusted. And that's how they gain that power to be able to get close to the child. So the first phase of grooming is when uh, it's called the engagement phase. So the perpetrator has set up opportunities to have access to the child. Perpetrators may build special relationships or provide, like I said, things like gifts, right? Grooming includes manipulation of the family and community, as Belay said. Um, and in her book, Identifying Child Molesters, Preventing Child Sexual Abuse by Recognizing the Patterns of Offenders, Carla Van Dam discusses how molesters go through a process of grooming the community in addition to the child in order to appear respectable and helpful, thereby gaining access to um, children. This phase is ongoing long before any sexual interaction may occur. It corresponds to what is proper, popularly called grooming, and there may be absolutely nothing about this type of interaction which could be recognized as dangerous to a child. The next phase is the sexual interaction phase. So this is the beginning of the sexual interaction and the perpetrator um, probably will escalate from non-touching to touching behavior. Um, the abuse may include exposure, masturbation, physical contact uh, and or penetration and may occur one time or more often many times uh, in escalating type behaviors. And so then we move on to what is known as disclosure, which is what we hope happens in every single case. Um, disclosure is basically, you know, find an adult, a form of authority finding out about the abuse that is going on. Uh, disclosure of the abuse can happen accidentally. Maybe somebody discovered it. Somebody uh, walked in on the, per on the person uh, doing this. Uh, and in some cases, the child might actually decide to tell someone. It is very, rare, very rare for a perpetrator to voluntarily tell someone that they're abusing a child. And disclosure can often create a crisis as the family responds with anxiety and alarm and perhaps with reactions of disbelief. Like we said earlier, the, the perpetrator, they're not just grooming the child, they've groomed the entire community, the family. So it's really difficult for them um, to believe that this person that they have trusted for so long could actually have harmed a child. And it's even more difficult to believe if it's a family member, you know, if um, it was an uncle or an aunt or somebody close to the family, it makes it a lot more difficult. It, and it brings up a lot of tensions and crisis uh, because the offenders are often very social people and manipulative. Abuse is often overlooked or else it's viewed as a one-time error in judgment. They're not gonna do it again. And a lot of times they also minimize or blame the victim. And it's important to remember that most child molesters don't fit the media stereotype of a dangerous sexual predator. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't just look at them and know they're a child molester. They <laughs> might nothing... not have a van. <laughs> yeah, they might not have a white van. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing in their face that says like, oh yes, this is a pedophile. Like it can be somebody that you've known for a long time. Um, or it can be, you know, somebody who looks completely normal. And a lot of times this leads to suppression, um, which is the final phase. And this happens when uh, family members may try to deny that the abuse occurred. Um, they can try to minimize the severity of either the abuse or the child's response to it. And this is a stress provoking and frightening time. It's important to remember that the child came to somebody they trusted and they spoke up about something. So it 
does create a lot of tension when the family is thrown into chaos and they don't know what to believe. And in their anxiety and stress, they lash out and say, well, no, this cannot be true. But in saying that, they are suppressing the child's voice and they're saying, I don't believe you. Even if that's not their intent, that is how it's taken. Um, and there is widespread confusion about what constitutes child sexual abuse. Ambiguity and the lack of a decisive response very often work in the offender's favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say also to add uh, to this, you know, why we see as sexual, sexual assault and sexual abuse advocates, why we see so many adults who come to, to services later in life because this experience happened when they initially disclosed to a child and then later on um, sought services. And a lot of times um, what was so challenging and why it's so hard for the resilience piece is because of this oppression piece. Michelle, who is it that wrote that book, Love with Accountability? That is um, uh, Aisha Shahida Simmons. Yes, That's and it's it is. such a perfect example of this. Um, she unfortunately um, suffered sexual abuse when she was a child. She disclosed to her parents and was then suppressed. Um, and as an adult, this book is conversations with her parents where they are finally coming the realization that they suppressed their child's voice at a point in time when she was suffering um, and when she had trusted them to come forward and to be able to protect her and they didn't. Um, and I feel like that is just like such a, yeah, it's just so relevant to this. Right, right. Like the healing has to be done sometimes with those people uh, who uh, maybe failed to protect you and not as much on the person who actually uh, committed the abuse. Um, so when we're working with adults who've experienced child sexual abuse, these factors really come in to play on how this kind of went through these grooming phases and, and when disclosure was believed and, and when um, children were or weren't suppressed and how they, they kind of heal and grow up. So mm -hmm. thanks for that, that was a great example. Uh, let's, call, let's test our knowledge of grooming phases. Okay. So, start this. so we are going to identify the correct grooming phase. So the example in this situation, what is the correct grooming phase in the situation? Carrie tells her teacher that someone has been playing a game with her that involves taking off her clothes. I'll give you a minute to kind of think about that. This is the disclosure phase. So disclosure of abuse may happen accidentally, as Soleil was saying, when someone discovers the abuse. In some cases, the child may decide to tell someone, uh, or it could have been just a talking or describing about the game that created the actual disclosure uh, by saying what kind of game that is, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So next question. So identify the correct grooming phase. Um, during a meeting with an advocate, the father, Rick, states that there is no way his uncle could have abused a child and that it was just a harmless game. So this is the suppression phase. Family members trying to deny that the abuse has occurred which can minimize the severity of either the abuse or the child's response to it. Mm -hmm. And so next question. All the parents on the block rely on Barry. Barry is always willing to babysit at the last minute, especially for single moms who have evening shifts. So what grooming face would this be? This is the engagement phase. So um, perpetrators will groom the community, as Soleil has said, in addition to the child in order to appear respectable and helpful and thereby gain access to children. In this particular scenario, there's like the additional, like, especially for single moms, you know, um, where they really have, yeah, where they really are having more 
more limited options than those with maybe more resources or more family assistance. So that's an important aspect of that as well. Well, and it's single moms whose work hours are outside the traditional work hours of nine to five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that yeah. makes it even harder to find childcare. Right. Bakers are not usually open at night. Okay. Next question and last question for this section. Um, the assistant high school baseball coach has been coaching for 30 years and has always been available to take the team on overnight trips. What phase would this be? So this is the engagement phase. This is grooming the community. Again, in addition to the child in order to appear respectful and helpful, um, you know, the always available overnight trips, you know, doing this for a really long time, uh, being so a, it's a close person that they know, right, a close person that they know to gain access to children. Now, one of the things that this does to us as those who are learning about grooming is to really freak us out and think <laughs> this can happen to, you know, this can be anyone now. Uh, and then paranoia are, bounds. Yes. And then we are experiencing our own vicarious trauma because this is new information for us and there's some suspicion. It's important to know that, you know, we have to be, um, that we're creating um, opportunities for resilience. Uh, in children that we want to also, in part of this training, really talk about um, what we do uh, to kind of um, bolster and protect against this, uh, the kind of protective factors that we'll get to at the end. Uh, so don't worry that we'll get to that. But first we'll talk about the uh, impact of abuse on, on children. So the degree to which a child is affected by the sexual abuse is influenced by a number of things. Um, the child's previous experiences in history, if they have been abused before, if they um, have a history of not being believed in general about lots of different things by their family, um, if there's been neglect, um, or other um, just experiences of other family members they've known being sexually assaulted. All of this, these kind of previous experiences in history really kind of um, lead into how a child is impacted. I'll also say, you know, there's been um, uh, children that I've worked with who, you know, because they, they knew that their family history had been so hard, even not related to sexual abuse, but just poverty and um, mom working really hard and and just understanding the struggle. Being a real parentified child meant that they weren't, um, that they really pushed it down and didn't dis disclose it and didn't wanna be uh, a bother. So some of that, those experiences as well can really impact how they're affected. The nature of the, of the sexual abuse and the child's reactions so um, there's lots of different ways that children could be abused and ass or assaulted. Um, again, we're going from, from touch to penetration, and there's lots of degrees in between um, how often it happened um, and who it was, right? If it was in a purported kind of safe location. If this is happening in a child's room, a place that's supposed to be safe and theirs, that really changes the nature of, of that space and that room and, and the violation. Uh, or if it happens in church and there's a, a connection to um, safety for them around their church or faith community, things like that, right? So we have to take all of that into consideration around that nature of the assault and then the child's reactions to it. Uh, there's definitely been children who have been assaulted in like, you know, a game and it was explained to them as a game, but they didn't understand it as sexual abuse until after disclosure and after it was explained that it wasn't okay, then their reaction changes, right? Uh, sometimes they might be in a place where they're like, this doesn't feel okay, or there's something wrong here, or there's something, but then once it's given a name, that can also change that child's reactions as well. 
uh, how others are responding to the disclosure of abuse. And we're looking at the grooming phase and seeing suppression is something that really assists perpetrators in being able to um, abuse and groom, right? The, the way that they're expecting the community and the family to suppress it or to respond to a disclosure with disbelief is part of that process of making it uh, so they have that access uh, to children. Um, so the responses and how our families will respond to us if we're disclosing or people that are close to us and trusted, how quickly people respond, how um, the, our demeanor when we hear disclosure, all of those things really impact um, how that child will be affected. As well as a lot of the cultural and social political uh, context in which the child is living, including um, the forces of oppression in which um, families and children are living. Uh, how is racism uh, being um, a factor in a child's life? How is poverty a factor? Um, are they called names or bullied at school because of the kinkiness of their hair or because of the language their parents speak? Um, because of the um, maybe the very- What? Oh, the food, the food they, they eat. eat. Yes. The, their perceived masculinity or femininity if it doesn't match what people think it should be, right? Those kind of things and those oppressions. And how does that factor in, right, to how they heal or are impacted? How has that been a factor in, in their assault in general, that they were taken advantage of because of this uh, perceived identity groups or um, the oppression uh, in society? And then finally, it's really important to know that the child express, that children express the effects of child sexual abuse really differently at different ages. Younger children are more resilient. They have less language for things um, than like an older child, right? Who's gonna be able to really more understand what is happening and being able to, to name things. And our ability to verbalize that can really impact um, how we're affected. Yes, absolutely. Um, ability to verbalize and then as well, um, like you're saying, how the reaction goes to that verbalization. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit more about each of these factors that the critical pre-abuse factors that increase the risk that a child will develop serious problems include the child's prior psychological concerns, especially a history of anxiety problems, or if a child has previously been sexually abused or experienced other trauma, there's just a higher risk. Many of us, if they come from families where that's kind of like, every, it happens to everybody, that's just the norm, it's normal. Right, this is what, uh, yeah, we all just try to stay away from that one uncle, right? Like that, there's that kind of story sometimes within families. Many studies have shown that the more trauma and adverse life experiences a child has, the higher risk of developing problems. So we're gonna to continue to talk about that um, a little bit later in this presentation, as well as the history of uh, marginalization and oppression. Yes, so there's the, oh, can we stop this really quickly? I... Yeah, so marginalized um, communities is a big issue as well. And it goes back to, uh, you know, culture and community and how that can sometimes aid in the grooming process. Um, and it can also influence disclosure um, for different reasons. For example, some of us who come from cultures that are a lot more touch-based and a lot more like community-based in the sense that like, you know, you walk into a room and they're like, have you greeted everyone? And greeting everyone involves, you know, kissing them on one cheek or two cheeks. Um, and then you don't really get the option of skipping, like not traditionally, you know, like it's like, oh, did you say hi to your uncle? Did you go kiss your uncle? And you're taught these things since you're itty bitty, right? Every time you walk in to the point, like even now as an adult, and like I said, for me, like I come from one of these cultures, right? As an adult, I will walk into a room. As a full grown adult, my dad will still say, did you greet everybody? And by that, he means, did you hug and kiss everybody in this room? Um, 
And so there's a there, there's already a cultural perception that touch, even touch towards strangers, is normal and accepted. And it's not to say that it's unsafe all the time, but it is something that a perpetrator can use in their defense, right? Like, I didn't do anything. This touch is socially accepted. Um, also, you know, how, are, how do uh, cultures and communities view sexual assault? Um, there are some cultures where it's a shame to the family. Like, they, not only does the victim suffer but like the entire family would be put down by the community um, and suppressed as a family if they come forward with this so there's a lot of hesitation because they are seeing that there is an issue not just with having like bringing their child's voice up but that there will be repercussions for the entire family and if their life is very enmeshed in community and socialness with their like community of origin or um, of descent, then it can really, really affect their lives. It, it will have very extensive ripples, basically. Um, as well as with gender norms, it becomes easier to blame the victim if you come from a community that is very rigid in its norms. So if a male presenting individual is not manly enough or is not tough enough and it's like you know real men don't cry or real men don't do this and you're telling this to the children since they're very young and you have a child that's slightly different and they're expressing um their gender in slightly different ways maybe not quite conforming to the rigid gender roles that um their community has then it kind of becomes an easy scapegoat to say like well you know, he was asking for it, like, that's not how a boy acts, a girl acts, kind of thing. Um, there can also be, another issue that can affect disclosure is the fear of immigration status. Um, if you are not documented and you are being abused, you feel often that you have a lot less resources and actually, a lot of times in these situations, when you're talking about um, somebody who's abusing an individual that is undocumented, and this actually happens regardless of whether the abuse is sexual, physical, emotional, is that the perpetrator will use that status of being undoc undocumented as a way to keep the victim silent because they will say, you know, don't tell anybody or I will make sure that you get deported or don't tell anybody or I will make sure that not just you get deported, but your whole family. I'm going to deport your mom. I'm going to deport your dad. All I have to do is call the cops. And so they hold this over the victim um, endlessly so that they think that like there's no way they, they, they can't reach out for help. There's nothing that they can do. And that's the feeling that just pervades them and it causes disclosure to be a lot more difficult yeah it just is such a tool for that suppression phase right mm -hmm, absolutely and then or else the child might become from a community that child removal is very common um the united states does not have the best track record on having keeping um children from bipoc communities with their families a great example of this uh, is um, our native communities that have lost so much, uh, so many of their children, and with that, so much of their culture, their beliefs, their ties, their ancestry. Um, and so, with the, in these communities where removal has historically been a hair, you know, very sensitive hair trigger removal kind of thing, like over what could be nothing, like literally. Not, not just like, oh, it's harmless, but like something that was harmless. There is a much greater fear to disclose because even if you are a non-offending parent, right? And your child has come forward and said that they have been sexually abused by somebody you know. Even as non-offending parents, there is a pervasive fear that 
If I take this to the authorities, they will take my child away from me. Even if I didn't do anything wrong, technically, they will still take my child away from me. And I have all of these generations of history to back that up. Perceptions are sometimes as strong, if not sometimes stronger than the reality of what might happen in a specific circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that can make disclosure a very difficult subject. Um, and it can often prevent, like, lead to some very severe suppression of what truly happened, mm -hmm. thus comp compounding um, the uh, adverse childhood experiences, really. Like, it just ties straight into that, right? Like, it's adding more negative experiences to an already traumatic and negative experience that a child is going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what those adverse childhood experiences are, right? So some, there is, let's see, Dr. Vincent Felitti. He was the head of the Department of Preventive Medicine at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. Uh, he began to delve into the reasons for um, high dropout rate of patients who'd been successfully losing weight in Kaiser's obesity program. He found a surprise that a high proportion of those dropping out had histories of childhood abuse or neglect. Dr. Robert Anda, who had been doing research with the Centers for Disease Control uh, on psychosocial origins of health risk behaviors in patients at um, VA hospitals, heard Felitti talk about these findings in, in, in 1992. They both began to collaborate on the largest scale study of, uh, to date of the incidents and effects of childhood trauma known as the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Also known as ACEs. ACEs, right. Together, they studied over 17,000 individuals examining the relationship between traumatic experiences during the first 18 years of life on adolescent and adult medical and behavioral issues, sexual behavior, healthcare costs, and life expectancy. So as I kind of begin to share their findings, keep in mind that their population were uh, individuals who had health insurance. So they were enrolled in Kaiser Permanente Insurance System in San Diego. They were well-educated. Only 6% of these did not graduate from high school. And 81% sought regular care from their providers. 80% were white. So if you think about the cultural context and history of oppression and marginalization, on top of this, this isn't even um, this isn't even capturing that yet. So that's a whole nother layer onto this. So keep in mind that that there are limitations to this particular study. Absolutely, so you're talking about individuals who, like, you know, we're saying like certain communities are scared to speak to the to people about what right. has happened. We're also seeing that like these are the same communities very often that don't have the the means or the tradition or the confidence to be able to seek just basic medical health care. Right. Absolutely. So each of the participants that were in this particular study, um, they answered 70 questions about their childhood experiences, and then their health records were used to identify the health outcomes. The adverse childhood experiences questions came from existing standardi standardized instruments. The researchers did not make up their own new ideas about what child abuse or domestic violence. They used existing tools in the, from those fields. So. This information can be really hard for us for a variety of reasons, because we all know people who have struggled with these experiences. Many of us have served children or families who are struggling with them. And adverse childhood experiences are personal to most people um, who do this work and are taking this training. The study found that over 60% of Americans have one or more of these adverse experiences. So that's as a child, some kind of sexual abuse some kind of physical abuse, the emotional abuse, physical neglect, or emotional neglect, um, a mother that was treated violently, right, so domestic violence within the home, uh, substance abuse being used within the home, mentally ill, depressed, or suicidal person in the home, M parental separation or divorce, hugely common, right, 
and, or incarceration of a family member. So one or more of these things is incredibly common, right? But also know that this ACEs study does have its limitation in its, its sample study and what they asked about. So what he found uh, when this research began really surprised him that there's a direct correlation. I wanna say correlation, not causation. Just because these things happen to you doesn't mean that, that you will have poor outcomes, but there is a correlation, a connection, right? Between the number of ACEs and the prevalence of a wide range of health issues like smoking, like drug use, being a victim of sexual or physical abuse, but also things like diabetes and obesity, heart attacks and early death. So the primary finding of the ACE study is a dose response relationship between adverse experiences and poor physical, mental and behavioral health. So the bigger the dose of ACEs, the bigger the ACE score, the bigger number of uh, health problems. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it doesn't mean that it was causation, but the more ACEs that you have experienced or that a person has experienced in their life, the more propensity or likelihood that they will also have difficulty in one of these or be affected by one of these range of health issues. Um, so the study was also done in Washington. However, it was a modified a bit. Uh, to begin with, they could only do the study in regards to eight of the ACEs. Um, so the ACE score in the Washington data is a score of zero to eight ACEs. And they weren't able to ask about child neglect because the questions that the CDC developed for this, um, they didn't make it through Washington's rigorous testing progress process. So in Washington, ACEs are common. And in fact, they are almost as common as they were in the initial study population, which was in San Diego, California. 62% of Washington adults have an ACE score of one or more. So half of the population here in Washington state, over half of it has had been impacted by at least one adverse childhood experience. 26% um, have an ACE score of three or more and 5% have an ACE score of six to eight. The news that ACEs are this common can be hard to hear. And again, for a variety of reasons, right? Um, a, we went back to the different, um, what constitutes an ACE um, score it is, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, mother treated violently, household substance abuse, mentally ill, depressed or suicidal person in the home, parental separation or divorce, incarceration of a family member. A person that has gone through all of that, that's difficult for even you as a provider to hear that and also have to try and help people through it. Um, so it's important to be aware of um, the secondary trauma that that can cause. Um, we all know people who have struggled with, these, with adverse experiences. And so what do we mean when we say, oh, ACEs are common? It means that out of most of us here um, with this, like most of us in the state of Washington, most of us in general, but like if we're, we're talking like here in this webinar, most of us have a, a personal experience with ACEs. Um, and so, and you're talking about like things that you've undergone, things that everybody you know, for the most part has undergone, things that we have record data that says that over half of the population has undergone, it just really hits home. Um, there are many thousands of Washingtonians who have seen this PowerPoint or a similar one. Um, and some people have been very deeply touched by the data, they've been moved to tears, and that is okay. Um, a lot of the people who have you know, had very strong reactions, emotional reactions to this material. Um, afterwards, they say that a lot often say that they feel liberated. They say, oh, okay, so these things in my life, they're interconnected. There's a reason why my life is hard and if there's some very good reason. And sometimes 
knowing, just knowing that there is a reason why something happens in your life is in and of itself a relief. It's a um, validation, right? Yes, it's a mm-hmm. validation. It's like, oh, okay, so it's not my fault. Like, I can work to change it. I can work to, you know, address and heal it, but I'm not causing this for myself on purpose. Um, some people have asked us, there are other ACEs, and the answer is probably yes. Uh, these nine types of experience are proxy for toxic stress. So that's the kind of stress that uh, creates elevated stress hormones for prolonged periods of time um, and through critical or developmental periods. So you have young children who are growing up. They're very sensitive. They're developing into the adults that they're going to become. And they are surrounded by these factors that are causing them to be stressed a large percentage of their time. Um, they are re- some of the researchers um, refer to the type of stress that causes stress hormones and neurotransmitters to be released and to remain at high level for long periods of time as toxic stress. Um, and several other people will refer to this as complex trauma, um, which is also difficult to hear. You know, you don't want to have- how many of us want to think of a child, a young child um, living with complex trauma? And unfortunately, that does happen. Um, so we've covered how the data is not positive. <laughs> right. And I was just going to say to you, uh, Soleil, that the, um, the, you know, again, this is an incomplete data set, too, because yes. we know that toxic stress, you know, can also happen based on, on just constant experiences of racism or xenophobia, sexism, sexual harassment at work. Uh, yes. um, it just, it, there's lots of different places where this can come from. So when we say probably yes, they're just not, you know, tested in this study, you know, that we're thinking about all those outer layers of things that we don't even know about uh, Mm -hmm. outside of the ACEs score. Well, and also it can depend by um, community or like, you know, an individual and how they, how they identify. Um, The initial study said that it was 80% um, white individuals. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't think to be asking about racial abuse, um, Mm -hmm. about discrimination, about um, social suppression, because it wouldn't be part of their everyday life. Right. Um, so how is this research helpful to our work? We know it's not that it's depressing research, um, but why do we do it? Why do we want to know this research? Um, so in many ways, the research gives power to the stories of survivors and advocates. It goes back to what Michelle was saying. It's validation. It's saying like, hey, it's not just an anecdote somebody told you. We have the data that backs it up. You're right. Um, and understanding the science behind responses to end the potential effects of trauma can validate survivors' experience and it eases the self-blame and the shame that they often feel. Goes back to that hope of being able to say, like, oh, okay, it's not something I'm doing consciously, it's not something that is my fault. And just being able to take away that burden of it's not your fault. Um it's very liberating. Um, so educating about ACEs, it empowers advocates, both advocates and survivors, to understand the connections between uh, connections to self, to oneself, to one's health, well-being, uh, and even to parenting. Um, because these individuals who suffered like these ACEs, and when I say these individuals, you know, most of us here have gone, undergone at least one ACE, maybe more. Um, and as we move on and if we have children and we're raising children, this is also going to affect how we parent these children. Um, so ACEs research it reinfor- also reinforces the best practice of early intervention and dual generation work to stop the cycle of abuse and adversity. That is to say, we work with the parents and we work with the children, right? So that this cycle stops now, that when they grow up, they're not extending that parenting with that same toxic cycle. Um, 
if we work with adults and caregivers who have also experienced trauma, it may reduce the likelihood of outcomes that become issues for the next generation. Um, and if, when we're working with child survivors and their families, it can also reduce the likelihood of them experiencing more ACEs. Um, and all, it reduces the risk uh, for negative long-term outcomes. Um, so being able to work in this and address it, especially you know, as early as possible, um, it helps to minimize long-term trauma. And ultimately, the ACEs study tells a story. It tells a story about individual, community, and family health. Um, and when you open education from this angle, you open the door to conversations that communities may not have spoken about before um, because they would be reluctant to talk about them. Um, they don't, they want to pretend like it doesn't happen, but you're saying, look, we have a way for you to be healthier as a community, as a family, as an individual. So it does open more doors for conversation. And it provides evidence to our communities and as well to our funders um, for, you know, those of us who are advocates about the necessity of prevention and why this is so important. Yeah, I really like this too, because I think that sometimes if we've experienced child sexual abuse or we've experienced, you know, sexual assault or any kind of trauma, that sometimes it just sits in its own little place, you know, and I think one of the things that is so important about trauma-informed care is that we're looking at uh, people as a whole person, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of experiences, a non kind of linear, everything that's happened to me makes up who I am. And this is only one part of that, right? You're not, you're not defined by one thing. Right. So we really like this is looking at, you know, the ACEs study telling a story, right, about individuals, families, and community health. Um, because this is not just, uh, child sexual abuse is not just the responsibility of parents, it's not the responsibility of children, and it's it's responsibility of all of us, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to uh, prevent child sexual abuse, right? In all of the structural ways um, that we're making sure that children are protected from a number of um, adverse childhood experiences. Well, and it also takes a village to facilitate um, healing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's really important for us to remember is that families are the most central, powerful, and enduring um, influence in a child's life. So working with families as whole units, uh, being able to bring in, you know, the parents in the work that we do with children, um, making sure the families are strong as whole units and protective. Um, is the best way that we can work to help children heal and be protected. So let's talk about protective factors now that we talked about, you know, all the, the things that, you know, we experience that are hard as children. Let's talk about how we work to protect folks from them. So just as there are, are factors that place parents at risk for maltreating their children, there are other factors that may protect families from being vulnerable to abuse and that also promote resilience. So the protective factors framework addresses both risk and protective factors to help prevent child abuse and neglect. So it evolved out of the work of the Center for Study for um, Social Policy after the Doris Duke Foundation founded, uh, excuse me, foundation approached uh, the Center for for study of social policy in 2001 to create a strategic, feasible approach to child abuse prevention. So can, protective factors are conditions that protect families and promote resilience. Protective factors serve as a buffer against adversity when present in families. So the likelihood of child maltreatment goes down. So the buffer against diversity, right? How does our family pull together when something happens? What is that? How are we making the suppression phase irrelevant in the grooming phase, right? How are we able to kind of pull together, believe and make appropriate 
um, responses, that increases protective factors later on, right? That I know I can trust and feel safe within my family and my healing, you know, it's going to go way up. A protective factor framework focuses on strategies for building family strength rather on, than focusing on the risks and deficits, right? A strength-based approach. Kind of like positive reinforcement. Right. So here are the protective factors. So these are linked to a lower incident of child abuse and neglect. So parental and family resilience. We have social connections, concrete support that are, of course, for parents, uh, social and emotional competence of children, nurturing and attachment, and the knowledge of parenting and child development. So these protective factors are critical for all parents and caregivers, regardless of a child's age, sex, ethnicity, or race, racial heritage, economic status, any kind of special needs, or whether the child is raised by a single married divorced parent or by any other caregivers like grandparents or other family members, right? So all of these are important and are useful in all of those contexts. Where we see the ACEs was really limited, this is very much all encompassing. So to provide optimal protection to children and families, these five factors work best when they are not in isolation of each other, but rather when they're kind of overlapping like these cards are, when they're all kind of working together, uh, helping to reinforce each other. For example, any parents that are experiencing stress are more likely to be resilient when they have both a strong attachment to their child and strong social support right? They have best friends who will show up for them that they can call and kind of debrief with. They have family close by, um, you know, that there's just that strong, those strong social connections. These protective factors form the conceptual framework for guiding service providers work with children and their families. So the more protective factors that a program, a church, uh, a sexual assault program, a neighborhood, a community can build into their approach, the more positive um, outcomes can be for families. And that's how, that's the perfect way to um, be building that parental or family resilience. You know, you want these families to have adaptive skills and strategies so that they can persevere in times of crisis. Um, a family's ability to openly share positive and negative experiences and be able to mobilize to accept, solve, and manage those problems. Um, and it's important. That's why it's so important to have all of those um, cards in place for that, if, or as many as possible. Um, look, going into parental and family resilience, Dr. Mark Katz was a researcher in resilience and strength in the face of adversity. And so resilience is about the ability to stand in times of challenge and to bounce back when overwhelmed. We cannot prevent stress or crisis from happening to families. Unfortunately, that's beyond our control. Um, but we can give them the tools to respond effectively so that when those high crises do happen, they don't escalate and the fallout does not negatively impact their parenting. So people think of resilience as being innate. You know, it just comes to you naturally. But what we know is that actually it is highly influenced by one's environment. Psychology has long talked about the concept of learned helplessness. And that is that when people are given the message that they can't succeed or are prevented from succeeding, it just saps their will to try. Um, and what we're talking about here is the reverse of the concept, right? You are providing an environment that is positive, validating, and it encourages the skills and internal resources that will help individuals to cope effectively when things are difficult. So what does that look like? For example, um, you have hope and optimism. You want this family to have hope and optimism. So what can you do? You can support the parent, the parental's decision making, the parents' decision making. There we go. Um, 
you know, support them and feel like, yes, you are making right decisions. Um, keep doing that. Um, again, what can resilience look like? Uh, having problem solving skills. And how do you do that? Well, you can really um, provide validation and encouragement. It goes back to that positive re reinforcement. When you see them, um, you know, being creative and actually coming up with solutions, even if the solution is not one that would work, you can still validate them and say, you know, that is such a fantastic idea. It doesn't really work in this scenario, but that is just so creative. Um, let's see what else you can come up with. You know, that's a more positive way of framing that and being like, oh, no, that's wrong. That's, you're not parenting right. Um, you want it to look like, you know, the ability to maintain calm or to restore calm. And what you can do to foster that in fam a family or in parents is provide support for self-care to be able to say, you know what, you do need to you know, spend some time on yourself. You are important too, and your health matters. Uh, what's that saying? You can't pour from an empty cup. Um, so you need to take care of what's going on inside of you so that you can then share that with the children that you're parenting. Um, and then we, like, we talk about self-care, but what is self-care, right? And how do you institute that or how do you foster that in a family that you're trying to um, bolster their family resilience. Um, and you can do that by providing training, providing support and problem solving. Um, and like if they're seeking help, you know, like that's another thing of, of resilience. Someone who's resilient also knows how to seek help and say, okay, this happened. This is what I need to do to be able to fix it. And I can't do this by myself. I need to seek help. Um, and People don't always know that to, how to do that or that they can do that. And so we can model that. We model resilience by doing these things and by saying like, hey, you know, I didn't know how to do this. So I asked for help and I asked for help here. And so you're showing them that it's normal not to always have the answer, but it's also acceptable, in fact, encouraged to ask. Um, yeah, so I would always do that with um, with uh, clients when I was working with uh, survivors in direct service. You know, it'd be like, ask me a question, and I'd be like, I don't know, let's find out. Like, yes. and sh be like, okay, let's Google it first. Let's start here. Okay, so you know, just like trying to find the things and be able to model like, here's how we start looking for information and. And some of our most important jobs we have as advocates is connecting people to community resources. Like a lot of people don't know, for one, that there's a sexual assault agency. And if they happen to find you, then they also, you know, might not even know that there's, you know, a local housing program, that there's, you know, this food bank or this other thing mm -hmm. that you're eligible for this, that, you know, what a protection order is, like all kinds of things that, you know, just giving them options, providing all of that and saying, look at all this stuff that might be available for you, just kind of widens that lens out from like this, focusing on this thing that's hard to kind of helping to widen that lens. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I really loved um, about what you just said too, is that you said, you know, I don't know. Um, and that is so important because all too often individuals who come from these, you know, backgrounds where they've had uh, like multiple aces in their own childhood, and it's a family cycle. Um, we've also talked about like marginalized communities, lack of education. So they often think, you know, and they're seeing you as the advocate, and you're kind of this like, oh, you know, she's educated, so she knows this, like. Clearly, somewhere in college, they must have taught her how to do all of this, um, and they didn't, right? But they don't know that. So there's this concept of like, well, I don't know that because I'm not educated. And I've seen that a lot when I've been working. I've even seen it from um, fellow colleagues that had like 20 years of work experience and no college education. And I would ask a question, and they would say, you know, oh, well, you're the one that know. You're the one that's educated. And I'd be like, no, 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 
I have book smarts. You have 20 years experience. Tell me your experience, like help me figure this out. And it's the same with um, the people that we are working with, that we're advocating for, to be able to tell them like, hey, I also don't know everything. So you don't know this and I don't know this and we're very similar in that. And now let's go find this out together. And that's just such an important element of being able to form that connection with the clients that you're advocating for. Yeah. Um, and then that also leads, leads you to like, you know, future orientation. You want to basically be your client's cheerleader, you know? And the thing about um, the people that we advocate for and the families that we work with and the parents that we work with is that they are individuals who have gone through a traumatic experience, are in extreme crisis, their whole life has been turned upside down, and they're not always the nicest, most patient individuals that we meet. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can just be like, oh my goodness, this person is such a thorn in my side. And it helps, I find it helps me, and if I, it helps the individual I'm working with, if I can frame it to like, oh my goodness, this person is such a thorn in my side, but they are finally advocating for themselves. And like, you know, like they are a thorn in my side because they're saying, hey, what about this? What about that? And so I try to reflect that by saying, you know, you're doing the right thing. You are parenting correctly. You are being an involved mama, an involved daddy. Like you are truly doing what you're supposed to do and just have that cheerleading effect of validating and upholding the whole like you are the expert in your life you're the expert in your child's life and you can do this in fact you are doing this right and I think you know what my colleague Tracy would always say like you know if you can't find anything maybe you know always find something positive to say always find something encouraging to say even if it's like you know everything is hard but that I like that shirt you know like she would always <laughs> say things like you know like trying to always find the nugget that can be encouraging or, or, or cheerleading, something to start when we're talking about like a strengths-based approach in family resilience, like this is great. And this great thing is a springboard to your next thing, mm -hmm. right? So let's talk about, now that we're talking about, you know, building family resilience, let's talk about what advocacy with children looks like in the context of our services uh, in the next uh, few slides uh, before we end. So advocacy with children who have been sexually abused is really challenging but very important work. Um, because the reactions and responses of adults following a child's disclosure of abuse can play such a just crucial role in their healing uh, we as advocates are often in the position to support the child and to do that encouraging of non-offending uh, family members to support the child in the most positive ways possible. For us to work really hard to uh, suppress the suppression phase, right? To, you know, encourage the positive rallying around that child. Uh, so that they can be the most resilient as possible in their healing. So our work with other professionals in legal and healthcare systems can help improve the experience of these children and their families um, after abuse. And then also just, it's just important for us to remember that we are part of an early intervention in healing, right? We wanna make it so that that ACE is not determinative of their future, right? Because part of, the, of what defines an ACE is how that response happens, uh, you know, to heal from it, to address it, to acknowledge and validate it, to create safety after it, right? So true. And when you're advocating, when you're working with advocacy with children, you're working with children, and it's important that, you know, we're forming connections with the family, but we are also forming connections directly with the children that we are serving. And we have to do this in a way that validates the child's experience, but also empowers the child. Because 
in all of this process, right, there's been a large amount of power and control that has been taking, taken away from them. Um, even like if you're talking about grooming, so often it's like, oh, we have this special relationship. But that's a relationship in which the child does not have um, power and control. And so when you are doing this, when you're advocating with children and you're first creating your, 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 your relationship, your contact with the child, the way in which you do that is that you're modeling to begin with ways in which boundaries, consent, um, and autonomy should be presented, but you're also, and you're also doing it verbally with the child um, by the way in which you treat them, which you, like, is clearly different than how they've been, for the most part, how they've been treated before. So examples, for example, start off by telling the child, you know, they're very brave for having come forward. Reassure them that they did the right thing by telling, um, that that took bravery, that took courage, and they made the right decision. You know, you can bring snacks, um, make sure that their parents approve because the children, you know, can have allergies. Bring snacks, bring small bottles of water. Um, most humans in general always appreciate something to eat. Um, if a parent or a caregiver is present during your interactions, that's fine, but make sure that you still direct your remarks to the child. You're speaking to them, not to the parent, because you want them to know that they are also have a they also have a say in what is happening. Um, ask the child if they know why they are meeting an advocate, why they're meeting you, and then ask them if they know what an advocate does. Do they know what you're going to be doing? And most of the time, they're going to be telling you no. Um, so explain this in age appropriate language. Um, think about like, if you have children, how would you tell your children um, about what you do for work if you have young children? Um, if you have a teenager, you know? And if you don't, Google also helps. <laughs> you wanna keep the first meeting short and friendly um, because the goal is for the child to feel comfortable with the advocate, not to just push them all of a sudden into this long intense relationship. And make sure that you pay attention to a child's body language. Um, if a child retreats, um, won't look in your uh, eyes or whatever, that's okay. Like, respect that. If, you know, they want absolutely no touch contact, absolutely 100% respect that. Um, but also, if the child is antsy and, or acting out and clearly wants to leave, you can actually give them that option. And I know that that's not something that necessarily occurs to a lot of us. It doesn't occur to me, at least not in the beginning, but you can say, you know, hey, I'm seeing that you're not um, wanting to do this right now. We can stop. We don't have to be meeting right now. Um, and giving them that option to walk out of that meeting is an actual step forward in creating a connection with them because you are returning autonomy to them. Um, One of the things fully that I like to, that just because you bring up the antsy thing that I think is not on this list is like having things like yoga balls that they can yes. sit on or like be bouncing on because sometimes they do want to be there, but they're just like, I don't sit still. That's not what I do, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, fidget spinners or whatever, things to color draw on. Sometimes it's easy to just kind of be coloring while chatting. So you don't have to look at somebody in the eyes if you don't like to, right? So there's so many different ways of like, I like to have a room that has, yes, you know, like those different options kind of around that's child friendly. So like they could pick up a thing or they can sit in different ways of being bag chair or a yoga ball or couch, yeah. right? I've sometimes started off um, a meeting with, um, by playing a game with a child such as, um, is it who am I, which, which one is it like, where you say like, okay, does this person have like red hair and everybody puts down the things, like just interactive games um, that involve the child starting to speak with you, even if it's not about what happened. It's about something totally unrelated, but it's just, 100%. just mm -hmm. getting them used to speaking with you. That's right. important. You're a new person and they're going through a traumatic time. They need to know that they can even just say hello. Yeah. Um, and part of like, you know, getting them used to having them speak with you is address the child's fears 
and acknowledge them. Acknowledge that those fears are real. Um, they're, sometimes, you know, those fears, there's not a solution. Like sometimes they're scared and it's not a type of fear that you can fix, but you can still say, hey, I know you're scared. Um, I know that you think this is going to happen and maybe it is going to happen, you know? Um, maybe a child is worried that because of all of the tensions coming up and this huge crisis and because quote unquote they, they spoke up that they're breaking their family apart maybe their parents are divorcing something is like that is happening and you can't say like oh no that's not going to happen you don't know but what you can say is hey i know that this is really difficult and this is a fear and it's a valid fear like it's okay to have that fear and then you can talk about coping techniques um we have talked before here at WixApp about um, breathing exercises. We have talked about um, making a worry box where they write down their worries and stuff them in the box and then they can do whatever they want with the box, including setting it on fire. Um, we've even talked about handholds that, you know, show uh, the child like how to self-soothe, but also how to potentially communicate with somebody when they're uncomfortable. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that, there's a lot of different coping techniques out there that can be used. Um, and go out and find some decision that the child can make. Um, let them know that they have choices, even if it's something as simple as taking a stuffed toy to an interview. Yes, yes, you can. Which one would you like to take? Um, always let the child know what's next. Don't leave them guessing. And tell them when they will meet with you again, but don't make any promises. So. Don't say, okay, well, I'm going to see you next Wednesday if you don't actually know that, you know, or don't say, I'm going to see you next week if you're going to postpone that, just, but tell them where it's going. Like, don't, like I said, don't just leave them guessing. Um, also, something that you can do is that you can give the child your business card belonging just to them. You know, they see you handing out your business card to their parents, to everybody who walks by. You can give one to them as well because they are also an integral part and an integral voice of this process. Um, and then also always remember, and this is vital, the advocate's role is to support, not to investigate. You are there to support the child in their trauma and what they want. You are not there to investigate. Um, and that's important. That's an important distinction to make. Yeah. Also, that's, that's my favorite part of being an advocate. Right. Like, I don't have to find out what happened and I can be the only person there who is not asking questions of this child. Because mm -hmm. you're just there to support them, to validate mm -hmm. them, to bring back that sense of confidence and autonomy. Um, a lot of times a non-offending non parent or caregiver will May, will be present during these visits. Um, and this depends on the age of the child and whether the child or the caregiver is consenting for services. Um, but remember, this is a meeting for you to get to know the child. So don't spend this time talking with the caregiver, direct most of your comments, most of your questions directly to the child, regardless of age. Um, and after a brief time with the child and the caregivers, and if the child is able to communicate, some one-on-one -on -one time with the child can allow for um, questions that they, maybe they do not want to ask in front of their caregivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think some, sometimes what's really nice, too, uh, uh, is to have a separate advocate for the parent as there is for the child. Um, yes. You know, we don't want the, the parent to – sometimes it's most appropriate for the parent to be there when you're meeting with the child, but it's – but you're not having the meeting for the parent. And so the parent might need that, especially if their struggle is around that suppression piece of the grooming, right? Like, I can't believe that my uncle would do this. Like they're really needing to process it too. And they should have that opportunity to do that. And they should have that opportunity to do that outside of where the, children, where the child is, because then the child's not also carrying that baggage as well. Their yeah. parent gets to go through those stages of grief. Their parent gets to, it needs that opportunity to have a conversation with an advocate. So the advocate can say, you know, these things are normal. I understand how you could feel that way. Let me tell you about grooming and how this happens. And, you know, to, to kind of 
get them to that place where they're able to best support their child because they have that kind of avenue to say all the things that they shouldn't say in front of their kids, right? Or that, 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 that isn't helpful, but they really need to process it. That's great. We want them to do that. So having a separate advocate for that as well is, a, is just a really great idea. Well, also, if you think about it, often, you know, we're also talking with parents who they themselves were abused as children, and uh, maybe 100%. they never disclosed. Mm -hmm. Maybe they disclosed and were suppressed, or maybe they never disclosed. And so this is, in some cases, it's like they're going through the entire thing over again for the first time, but with the added issue of a child that depends right. on them that is going through this. Absolutely. Great point, Olay. So just kind of finally here, when we're talking about what, what our advocacy looks like with children, um, we, we work with children in the context of legal systems. Oftentimes, you know, child sexual abuse is a mandatory report. So lots of systems get involved, CPS and, and law enforcement and forensic interviewers and child advocacy centers and you know, multidisciplinary teams, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things getting involved. So however we can be, you know, kind of think about some of those simple places, like involving the youth and giving them a, information about what's happening, um, again, in ways that are age appropriate. Um, well, we're going to go on here, we're going to talk to this person, and this person's job is to ask you lots of questions so that they can get as much information about what's happened to you um, so that they can, you know, like, so they can make sure it doesn't happen again or, you know, like that kind of stuff that, that, that we're, we're trying to explain. Taking a tour is great. You know, there's a lot of things that we don't know what's gonna happen next and we can't make promises and we shouldn't, right? Uh, we don't know how a case is gonna end up. We don't know if a bad guy is gonna go to jail. We don't know if you're never gonna see this person again or not. Um, so what are the things that we can do in a lot of these uncertain systems? And one of them is to take a tour of, here's the, this is what the courtroom looks like. This is what the room where they interview people looks like. This is what the medical office looks like. And then talk about it and ask questions and look under the table if you want to, or look, you know, like just being able to really explore that and kind of talk about it. Um, I find this is super useful with adults as well, right? It's that, what are the things that we can make certain uh, to have less questions about when there's so many questions that we can't answer? Where are those places that we can create some more safety? Clarify what is and isn't. Um, the criminal justice system does not determine the truth, right? And I think that that is one thing that is really hard, especially for children or, you know, if they're in a household where they watch a lot of I don't know, Law and Order or SVU, there's just a lot of that on TV that we kind of absorb, you know, about um, the criminal justice system gets the bad guys. And I think that that's a, you know, it's a really a harmful myth all the time that it's, e that that's an easy thing that it wraps up in an hour, you know, procedural. Uh, and so I think always being able to clarify what is, what is and what isn't. So this happened to you because you're telling me it happened to you. And that anything that happens after this, whether or not they find some be guilty or not, does not take that away. So here's what is, and then all this stuff, you know, may be right, it may be wrong, but it is, um, doesn't necessarily uh, determine the truth, right? And so finding ways to kind of help explain that, help talk about that, um, help reinforce the belief, the normalization and validation that is our job as advocates. And that the legal outcome does not determine their healing or their worth. Prosecution is not necessarily for a personal sense of justice. And this is just as true for children as it is for adults. You are um, in your truth and you are saying what has happened to you and I believe you. And also a lot of the ways that systems work um, sometimes are needing more than that. And that's really unfortunate, right? That what are the, but you are still, you can still heal from this. You can still pursue lots of different things. You can still, you know, and not just you can be, you are 
amazing. You are worthy. You, you know, are, are doing the, the absolute best that you can. And you're still going to school every day and you're still doing these things, right? We're taking again, like when we're talking about resilience, taking that strength and using that as a springboard, a jumping off point for more a positive momentum. Mm-hmm. So as we start wrapping this up, guess what? The news is good. Um, we, I know we've gone through all of these depressing things and all of these like really sad, unfortunate, anger-inducing things. Um, again, please do what you need to do um, to make sure that you are restoring your sense of well-being and that you are, you know, taking care of your mental health. Um, but we do want to say, like, you know, the news is good. It's not all bad. Um, luckily, most children recover naturally and do not have long-term effects. Um, younger children tend to be less severely affected by child sexual abuse, usually because it's not violent and they didn't really understand the meaning of it. Um, working with young child survivors can be really vicariously traumatic. So keep that in mind for yourself as well and consider this as a reframe. Um, early intervention is best. So even if, if a Vola child is only four or six years old, intervention now means that the abuse it has, is more than likely has stopped. And children are resilient. So if you reframe this in your mind, as opposed to, um, you know, these poor kids, like these kids that have undergone this trauma at such a young age. And if you think about like, you know, these kids are resilient and they spoke up and, you know, more than likely um, the abuse is stopped. And so this means that now they have a better opportunity to move forward with their lives um, without increasing, hopefully, those um, ACEs. Um, and then also things to keep in mind, parental belief, support, and protectiveness is what is most important to the outcome for kids. It's not the legal system. It's not um, anything else as much as a kid needs to know that their parent believes them, that their parent supports them, and that their parent is there to protect them. And if that hasn't been the case in the past, being able to work it up with a non-offending parent um, to bolster that with the child and the family so that the parent does step up and is, you know, believes the child, protects the child, supports the child, that is what's going to make the biggest difference in that child's life. Because that is what mean what they're looking for, that validation from their parents. Um, and remember that our work with those parents can influence it. So that is why we're working with them about being resilient and becoming their cheerleaders. Yeah, absolutely, Sole. Thanks for saying those things too. That that really that re- the reframe about you know they might be young now, but they're just they're only six now instead of being like oh they're six and this is terrible, but mm-hmm. they're only six, and that means that when I'm working on the hotline that um, there's going to be one last like 40 year old who's calling me about when they were six, how nobody knew about it. Right. Or nobody believed them. Right. So I love that reframe that has always really helped me to in, in, you know, getting through hard days uh, in this work. So welcome to your work with children. And thank you for um, attending this webinar today. And um, we look forward to supporting you as um, members of the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs and new advocates. Yay.